I have no idea if this video will have a point by the end, but I mean, I hope it does. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill, and today we're talking about D&D again. Specifically, I've been thinking about alignment and how we think about alignment. Basically, I've been thinking about things like uh, the way that we present alignment. Uh, you know, we, we show it in this grid of uh, lawful neutral, chaotic, and good neutral evil. The way that we present that and the terms that we use to present it, I, I can't help but wonder if something that was meant to be a tool has become kind of restrictive just because of how we structure it, how we present it, how we serve it up to our players. So my favorite Shakespeare play is uh, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar. I'm very well aware that this sounds completely irrelevant. Well, you'll get it eventually, I hope. I hope. I hope a lot of things. If you're unfamiliar with the plot, basically uh, this takes place just at the, the transition, the crux, the, the careful, careful, the catalyst moment that sends Rome from a uh, republic into an empire. This moment, of course, being the assassination of Julius Caesar. So in Shakespeare's play, uh, we begin with a couple of Roman senators walking through the streets and all of the people of Rome are just out and about acting like it's a holiday and, you know, celebrating and stuff. And they're like, what the hell? It's not a holiday. And the people of Rome are like, but Caesar just beat Pompey in a battle. So we're all like taking the day off, bruh. <laughs> Which alarms the senators because uh, Julius Caesar has been gaining and gaining and gaining popularity. Very quickly, we're introduced to uh, Caius Cassius and Marcus Brutus. The two of them have a little conversation and basically it pans out that uh, Brutus is a little concerned that Caesar is becoming so popular because uh, he's worried that the people might decide to crown Caesar. And in fact, during this conversation between Cassius and Brutus, they hear a bunch of cheering and they don't know what it is. And then Casca comes out, who's another senator. And he tells them that before the people of Rome, Mark Antony offered a crown to, uh, to Caesar to say, be our king. And the people were like, yeah, be our king. And Caesar was like, no, 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 I will not be your king. And then Mark Antony offered again. And the people were like, yeah, be our king. And Caesar was like, no, no, I will not be your king. And then Mark Antony offered it a third time. And the people were like, woo, yeah, be our king, Caesar. And Caesar was like, oh, oh, you really like me. You really like me. But like not as sincere as when the flying nun did it. So basically everything is ramping up to the idea that Caesar has so much power right now because he is so popular with the people and that even if he doesn't technically take on the title of king he basically is king and so gaining that title which people are already supportive of uh that will be like the thing that gives him ultimate power so a bunch of the senators are worried about that for various reasons because they're like we are a republic he is not meant to be better than us so what do they do they start planning an assassination! Conspiracy ahoy! Meanwhile, Caesar is talking to Antony and he's like, Yo, do you think we can trust those guys? And Antony's like, I don't know, but probably. Anyway, next thing you know, they've got like, what, 12 people? What's the number? I should know this, it's my favorite play. I don't know, a bunch of senators all are in on the conspiracy and they're like, heck yeah, we'll go kill Caesar. And then during the middle of Caesar being a douche, they do kill Caesar. They try to explain to the people why they did it and the people are like, yeah, seems legit. But then Mark Antony explains to the people why they should be mad and they're like, hey, that's even more legit. And so all of the conspirators get chased out of Rome. They die in battle. Sort of, I mean, they do that Roman fall on your sword thing. So that's what happens in the play. That's the basic summary of the play. It will become relevant, I promise you. Now here's where it gets interesting, uh, if we're talking about good and evil, cause hey, bringing it back to the point. The thing that makes this play quite different from a lot of Shakespearean tragedies is that there's no clear-cut villain. You know, you've got Macbeth, the bad guy is Macbeth. Hamlet, the bad guy is Claudius. Othello, Iago. Are there other ones that I'm not listening that are really obvious? King Lear, you got Edmund up in here. Love Edmund. Oh, thou nature art my goddess. Now gods stand up for bastards. What a good speech. Caesar's a douche, but he also never does anything outside of the law. Cassius is manipulative and he lies to Brutus, but he does so in the name of the greater good. Brutus is an immensely flawed heroic character undone by his own hubris. And Mark Antony's kind of just a bystander party boy who wants revenge at the end, or is it justice? So here's where we get back to that thing I was saying about the way that we present uh, alignment in D&D. 
we've got this grid, right? And we say, where do you fall on this grid? And it's a little restrictive and sometimes a player might look at this and go, oh, I mean, I don't know. A good example of this is lawful. The idea of lawful, what is lawful? Um, do they follow the law of the land? What about when they change lands? Is it all about following whatever the law is where you are? Or is it about uh, an internal set of core beliefs that they must abide by at all times? There's a lot of wiggle room there. It gets a little less rigid when we uh, present it like this, like like that meme that's been hanging around for the last six months, the two axes that you can kind of plot your character on. But what happens if we start changing the labels that we put on things? Colville showed a great example of this in his uh, evil NPCs video that kind of sparked all of this thought in the first place. Uh, if you haven't seen the video, by some miracle, link in the description. But he shows a good example of this with uh, hero, villain, anti-hero, anti-villain. One of my favorite things about the tragedy of Julius Caesar is uh, this kind of back and forth, this question that is posed about uh, reason versus passion. Specifically, you get two very significant pairs for this. You have on the one side, Cassius and Brutus. Both of them believe wholeheartedly in reason over passion. But while Brutus is fully confident in his convictions that reason trumps passion every time, Cassius is wary of passion. He's wary of the power that emotion holds over people. On the other side of the fence, we have Mark Antony and Julius Caesar. Both of them are very passionate. They're on the other side of the scale. And while Julius Caesar is wary of the power that reason holds, Mark Antony, he's like, no, 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 don't even worry about it. We have some beautiful exchanges that kind of evidence these points of view. So you've got Cassius who says, uh, if I do fawn on men and hug them hard and profess myself in banqueting to all the rout, then then hold me dangerous. Meanwhile, in basically the same scene, Julius Caesar is talking to Antony, saying, Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Immediately next to each other, they're just like, boom, I don't trust that guy because of this thing. Opposite things. Because he relies too much on emotion to sway the opinions of others. Because he thinks too much. Because he spends too much time reasoning it out and using his intellect and his logic. You know, he loves not plays as you do, Antony. I love this play. My favorite line is when Julius Caesar continues and he says, would but he were fatter, seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he scorned himself and mocked his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Meanwhile, both of their right-hand men are trying to reassure them that reason or that passion won't win out over reason or passion. Mark Antony tells Julius Caesar that there's nothing to fear from Cassius, which is not true. Cassius done murders Caesar. Meanwhile, during their uh, conspiracy negotiations, there's this great moment where Cassius says, we should kill Mark Antony as well, because the people love him just as much as Caesar and he will be able to sway the people against us. But Brutus says, no, that'll make us look like butchers. We need to believe fully in the power of reason. We need to put our reason to the people and let them come to the logical conclusion that we were right. And so after they kill Julius Caesar, and Brutus has given his speech saying, here are our reasons for killing Julius Caesar. Brutus lets Mark Antony get up and talk to the people and he gets all up in their emotions and causes them to riot. He makes a dang mob. So then what if we take those uh, dichotomies of good and evil and lawful and chaotic and we tweak what they're called? Because I suppose by some measures you could replace law with reason, couldn't you? And chaos with passion. You see where I'm going with this? And then thinking about characters like Cassius and like Mark Antony, maybe we replace good with thinking of others, others before yourself, and we replace evil with self and putting yourself before others. Suddenly we've got what looks like a very, very different alignment chart that actually hasn't changed all that much. You see what I'm getting at? You tweak the names, you tweak the labels, and suddenly it's like, boom, everything changes how we can place a character on a scale. With the scale looking like this, the characters might be plotted in these positions. But then what if we tweak it again? What if instead of uh, looking at the self and others, on the other axis we put confidence and wariness. Suddenly we can plot them in slightly different places. Basically what I'm getting at is that alignment is a very interesting and very useful tool that at some point uh, we, we got stuck thinking about it one way and it became very very restrictive. So this is just an alternative way of viewing alignment and maybe messing around and, and if you can't find a way to express your character's uh, point of view, what is the word I'm looking for there? Convictions? No. Alignment. I would consider asking your DM or allowing your players to uh, chart them on a different alignment chart. 
Maybe their alignment is selfish passionate. Hold up, I'm editing this video right now and I just had the best idea. Like genuinely, this is brilliant. I don't care what you think, I know I'm a genius. So if you watched my campaign setting discussion live stream a little while back, or if you've seen a bunch of Matt Colville's videos, you'll probably be familiar with the idea of a central tension to your campaign. This is the concept that you pick just kind of two opposing forces, and along that scale is where you plant all of your factions or NPCs or major villains. So for example, Matt Colville tells us that he plants his along a, an axis of order or chaos. What if, when heading into a campaign, instead of getting your players to fill out a sheet that tells you whether they're good or evil, which isn't superbly useful to you, you ask them about where they fall on this grid of your central tension. For my campaign, my major dichotomy that I've set up has been tradition versus innovation, but when I look into it deeper, I suppose I've also got an undercurrent that talks about being disciplined or being wild. And boom! There it is! My own alignment axis to give to my players that tells me something about their character and where their character sits in relation to my game and the story that we're building together. Oh my gosh! This is the best idea I've ever had. This is the point of the video. It has a use now. You're welcome. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed these thoughts and ramblings. I am a lit nerd meets a D&D &D nerd. Meets a, an actor nerd. Anyway, I just, I hope that it, it got your brain doing brain motions. What are they called? Thoughts. If you did enjoy the video, you understand how the internet works. I presume there's lots of things you can click that will aid the engagement levels and will make the YouTube algorithm like me more. It's been a couple of months, but I've finally updated the Patreon Pantheon over there. So uh, if you haven't seen yourself added as a patron on my Patreon Pantheon, you can go and check out what uh, what minor divine title I've given you. Thank you as always to my patrons and to anyone who shares my videos. Those sorts of things really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma and I will see you some other time. One minute it's freezing, then I turn on the lights and I film the thing, suddenly my jumper is full of sweat. <laughs>